Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming so early this morning to start us off for Social Practice of Human Rights 2021. Um, my name is Shelley Inglis. I'm Executive Director of the Human Rights Center, and I very much appreciate President Eric Spina taking his time this morning to be with us and to provide us with some uh, opening remarks. I hope everyone online, if you're there virtually, can also see us and hear us. And uh, President Spina, thank you. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you and your staff for uh, developing really a great, great um, agenda for the symposium. Good morning, everybody uh, here in person where there's a lot, a lot of great energy and also to everyone out in Zoom land. Um, so war warm welcome to the scholars and advocates joining us uh, for the 2021 uh, Social Practice of Human Rights Conference. I wanna offer a special uh, welcome and thanks to students who are in the room and I know on Zoom and will be here uh, throughout the three days. I know students here at the University of Dayton uh, play a really a significant role in the Human Rights Center and uh, involved in the planning and execution of this conference. So, uh, so kudos to the students, really a great opportunity for them to connect so I just encourage all the professionals uh, to please make sure during breaks and so on that you uh, spend some time with our students. You'll be impressed as I know the, the faculty and staff are here at UD. Uh, this is um, here in 2021, a pivotal moment for human rights around the globe and in each of our backyards. Uh, the pandemic has upended all of our lives uh, but no one has been more seriously impacted than the vulnerable and marginalized who have faced uh, greater health, housing, employment, and other inequities. At the same time, the alarming rise of authorit authoritani authoritarianism and extremist movements is threatening to unravel the fabric of democracies and is leading to greater social unrest. If we are truly committed to human rights, it's urgent that we address racial injustice, climate change, and gender inequity. The University of Dayton's Human Rights Center has assembled a wide range of experts to contend with these issues and others during this conference. This will be an enlightening and I dare say energizing three days. So what does human rights advocacy look like against the backdrop that we're facing here in 2021? I'd like to offer three observations. First, we know the power of grassroots action and community-driven solutions. Erica Chenoweth has documented the growing trend of civil resistance movements around the globe. And not surprisingly, there's been a dramatic upswing as we faced so many injustices. From Hong Kong to Russia, from Lebanon to the United States, people are mobilizing and demonstrating to bring attention to injustices and ultimately to try to affect the change that we need. Nonviolent social movements can successfully counter regression in democracy and human rights in the US and globally. History has proven that time and time again. And young people like Nathan Law are at the forefront of these movements, serving as an important example for our students and for all of us as they consider their futures as servant, servant leaders in today's world. Let's not forget the power of solidarity to change the trajectory of our times. Secondly, we must continue to push back against the politics of hate and exclusion xenophobic violence, derogatory language, and discrimination have all been on the rise during the pandemic. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres stated it best, we must stop the spread of the quote, the virus of hate, end quote. As a Catholic Marianist University, our focus is on the movements and action that seek deeper and greater justice and dignity. We must not deviate as a human rights center, as a university, and as a society from that mission. 
Finally, COVID has spotlighted the fragilities, inequities, and injustices in our own local communities. Actions locally don't just impact local communities. They impact our environment and our world. The pandemic has made it crystal clear how much we live in an interconnected world. This conference will seek to make these connections clearer than ever before by integrating local perspectives, activists, and organizations who are taking action to address human rights challenges. These three days present an opportunity to break down disciplinary silos and develop shared goals. The challenges are enormous, you all know that, and the stakes have never been higher. But you are all defenders and promoters of human rights. You understand the complexity of the issues. There are no better minds to grapple with these urgent issues than those in this room and other experts joining us remotely. So I challenge you to be bold in your thinking. I know you will be and courageous in your approach, which you have been, and I know will be over these three days. I wish you a very successful conference uh, and enjoy your time in Dayton for those of you who are visiting. Thanks very much. Thank you, President Spina. We are always uh, pleased and blessed when he comes and talks about human rights issues. I know he feels strongly about many of them. Um, and it's very important to us at the Human Rights Center to have that kind of leadership supporting these efforts. I'm going to briefly um, take you through what we're going to do today and just give you a few tips uh, about this process and this conference. And then I'm going to hand it over for our first uh, keynote conversation. Just to say um, welcome again to uh, social Practice of Human Rights 2021. Uh, this social practice is really like no other in many ways, um, in the obvious ways that we're all sitting in masks and um, in, a smaller, in a smaller quantity than usual. And also that we have those joining us hopefully virtually throughout the process. This will be a hybrid conference. So do be aware that there are people joining us virtually at all times, and we are experimenting with how best to make a hybrid experience interactive, meaningful, and impactful. Um, we hope to learn a lot from this initial engagement, and thank you all who are here in person for coming and being with us despite this pandemic. Um, we will have all of the keynotes and plenaries in this room. We will also be having food either in the room adjacent or for lunch and dinner this evening with Erica Chenoweth in the cafeteria. For the round tables, we will be going up to um, the other side of the building and you will be escorted and there will be signs indicating where to go to attend your round table. If you have any questions, we have a fantastic group of students and uh, colleagues and staff who are all here. So please feel free um, to engage with them and ask them anything you might need to know about uh, the process today. Um, I just wanna thank uh, Anne Hudock in particular for coming and for being with us. Anne has been uh, a leading light as an alumna of UD in supporting human rights efforts on campus. She's an extraordinary human being and has been a great um, advisor and, and mentor to many of us here at UD working on these issues. She has a long bio, so I will take the opportunity. Um, I might shorten it a little bit, but Anne is president and CEO of Counterpart International. She brings more than 25 years of experience in international development. She uh, leads the organization of Counterpart and its mission to promote, sorry, civic participation and government accountability across their program portfolio. Before joining Counterpart International in 2017, Anne worked at Plan International USA, where she led the expansion of the international program portfolio and served as vice chair of the Plan Federation Program Directors Forum. She was a managing director at DAI, diversifying their work beyond US government 
funding and creating a strong portfolio with the UK Department for International Development or DFID. Before working with DAI, Anne was the deputy country representative and the acting country representative for the Asia Foundation in Hanoi, Vietnam. Democracy and governance issues were the foundation of her career in her roles as head of democracy and governance at World Learning in Washington, DC. As one of the first democracy fellows at USAID in 1997, and as special assistant to the Under Secretary of State for Global Affairs, covering the democracy, human rights, and labor portfolio. So we are so pleased to have her. She serves as the chair of our committee for the Human Rights Center. She works with us in many ways, providing young students from UD the opportunity to work in Washington and at Counterpart International. We very much appreciate her support and presence. And over to you. Thank you so much, Shelley. What a very warm and generous introduction. I have to say that for any of the things I've been able to do in my career, it certainly all began here at UD. And if it wasn't for UD and the experiences I had here, the mentors who are frankly still my mentors, I don't think I would have been able to do any of the things that I've done. So I'm deeply grateful. And I'm also very grateful for the Human Rights Center for all the work that it has done and for the ways in which UD has nurtured it, has incubated it, and as far as I can see, it is really off and running and in great directions. And I think the, the group gathered here today for the next few days for these sessions really is reflective of um, such a, a strong, diverse set of voices on some of the most important issues of our time. So it really is a true privilege to be here with all of you today. I am thrilled to be able to share a stage with Nathan Law. His bio is in the program and I'm not gonna read it to you, but I am going to encourage you to go online and buy his book that is about to be released December 7th. So I pre-ordered mine. I encourage all of you who still have a shopping list for Christmas, you know, it's out there. You can get the Kindle version, you can get the hard copy version, but it's a, from all I can see a very, very important piece of work and uh, something that I think should be required reading for all of us. The title is Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back. And that to me says it all. You know, I think that the theme of this conference, which is between peril and potential, also reflects that spirit of there are a lot of challenges, but there's a lot of potential. And that, I believe, is what we can talk about here today, is what are the threats, how are we experiencing them, and how can we collectively, through our common action, through our common cause and solidarity, how can we move forward? Because it would be all too easy, I think, to just sit in the dismay of what we see around us. And you know, no one knows this better than Nathan, who has given up so much for freedom and for democracy. And for that, we owe him an enormous debt of gratitude. I think when you see shining examples, beacons of light on a dark landscape, you know, that for me anyway is what keeps me going. And so I want to thank Nathan for all the ways in which he has provided that. In 2016, Nathan Law became Hong Kong's youngest elected lawmaker at just 23 years old. And a year later, he was imprisoned by the Chinese authorities for his part in the umbrella movement. I'm sure many of you followed that movement on the news and watched the, the events unfold with just as much shock as, as I felt. Um, he has since been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, very deservedly for his pro-democracy advocacy, and he has been named one of Time Magazine's People of the Year 2020. He has a master's degree in East Asian Studies from Yale University, and he is also a Pritzker Fellow at the University of Chicago, and he currently lives in exile in London. So I would ask as we listen to Nathan and have this amazing opportunity to have a conversation with him, for us all to think about what are we willing to give up? What are we willing to go for freedom and for democracy and for individual and collective rights? But also, what will you preserve? And I'll just tell you a very quick story that um, is a tragic story in the beginning, but has, I think, a very inspiring ending. And it's, 
It's what I would suggest we all try and preserve. Um, in 2019, the counterpart offices were attacked in Kabul in Afghanistan and blown up by the Taliban. And for six hours, my team was huddled in a safe room while the Afghan security forces tried to rescue them. And by some miracle and probably good security planning, everybody got out alive. And after six hours in that firefight where the, the Taliban were throwing grenades at the door and trying to, in any way they could, blow them out of, of the office, um, the team emerged alive and, and thankfully safe. And when I had the privilege of a couple of weeks ago to have one of our team members who had safely made it to the US in our offices in Virginia, we were talking about how he felt when he emerged from that room. And he said to me, you know, I just felt so sad because the first thing I saw on the ground was a dead Taliban fighter. And he said, he's human just like me. That's a remarkable statement. <laughs> and it brings me to tears because I think if there's one thing we can preserve, it's our humanity. So with that, I am going to turn to Nathan, who I think has such inspirational stories for us and um, the opportunity for us to think about, you know, what is it that we're going to preserve and how will we fight back for our freedom? So Nathan, going back to your beginnings, because you've had such a, an incredibly inspiring career, can you tell us what the Umbrella Movement was and what drove you as a, as a young person, you know, who could have been doing many other things? Um, what really drove you to get involved? And what were some of what you think of as the most effective tactics of this movement in your experience? What can we learn from that? Um, thanks so much for your uh, introduction, Anne. Um, it's been my pleasure to be able to share with all of you, even though I can't see you. Um, and uh, it, it's definitely one of the most important chapter of my life uh, in 2014 when I was involved in the Umbrella Movement. It was a, a massive, uh, it was actually the very first massive civil disobedience action in Hong Kong that uh, are fighting for democracy. Um, in Hong Kong, we have never been um, granted a democratic system, even though the Chinese government promised all of us in 1997 onwards that we can elect our leaders by one, one, one a person, one vote. But for now, it, it, it has not been realized. And in 2014, when a group of students, they were so infuriated um, that the government just uh, have not been keeping their words and continuously to undermine our demands, we decided to step up. And there were a lot of civil groups working together and we make sure that we had the civil disobedience actions, which um, in our tradition, it was really rare for us to break the law in order to achieve justice. But we felt like democracy is much more than, um, than, than these kind of rules. And we, we just have to make our voice heard in such a closed system. So we decided to have a, a student strike and then to develop the momentum. And then we achieved to a point that we've got hundreds of thousands of people gathering in the hearts of Hong Kong, blocking a few major runways that could really paralyze um, um, the operation of the heart of the city. And it lasted for 79 days. In the process, we had negotiation with the government. I was one of the five students who took part in that negotiation. And we had a lot of, um, uh, 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 well, advocacy opportunity that we go into community, we go into schools, and we really talk to people, try to convince them to overturn their mindset about how we can resist and why we should resist. And in that circumstance, why using civil disobedience was a legitimate measure to do it, uh, given that we had been rallying peacefully, we had been uh, rallying in, uh, in accordance to, to, to the law for, for decades, but we didn't have the results. And Chinese government didn't feel the pressure to really do something to, um, to keep their promises. So we indeed um, had that massive civil disobedience actions for 69 days. Eventually, the Beijing government didn't listen. Uh, we didn't have the political reform that we wanted. But I think one of the major lessons that we learned in the process is that we, we, we planned the seat of civil disobedience. We had narrated the story about how the Chinese government betrayed Hong Kong people by not keeping their promises, by not implementing democracy. It really gives a lot of um, uh, education and understandings into the crowd 
that they started to really focus on the political development of Hong Kong and thinking that we need different tactics. We need more ideas on how we can preserve our voice and fight for democracy. So that was uh, definitely one of the major chapter in Hong Kong's democratic movement's history. And also for me personally, that I became from um, a, a, a student who just wanted to stay in the student union. I was the head of it for a year. Uh, when I got elected in, in school, I was literally thinking that I could, I could step off after a year and then I could learn some new language, go, uh, go to exchange and improve my grades, etc. But eventually when you slowly get into that setting of participating in different protests, witnessing injustice, um, police violence, and you witness a lot of your friends and fellows being arrested, facing trials, it, it, it really gives you a sense of um, passion and, and, and the way that you must um, um, receive the core of your conscience that it encourages you to keep going, keep going, no matter um, what, you, what you were thinking at the beginning of it. So it really keeps me rolling until to a point that I became a public figure in the umbrella movement. And I just had to tell myself that I must keep going because a lot of people gave their trust to me and they are still giving it. Um, I have showed a, a lot of responsibility and expectation and that is the only way um, I can um, really answer to their love and to their, to their support is keep going to do whatever I can to, to promote the voice, to fight for democracy. And that was um, the beginning of my activism and as a political activist. Wow, that's a fantastic, I think, overview of what motivates you and also some of the challenges that you faced. I really appreciate that perspective. And I think you know, one of the other questions I have for you in listening to this is, what led you to the path of electoral politics? You know, many of us, of course, have read the statistics of the decline of democracy and the rise of authoritarianism that President Spina just referred to. And, you know, you yourself were just mentioning the closed society with the human rights abuses and the, the challenges you were facing. And I could see that some people would say, what's the point of trying to go through the route of electoral politics? But what, you know, how, could you share with us some of your um, decision-making on, on why that path versus any other path? I was elected in 2016 as the youngest ever legislator in Hong Kong at the age of 23. I got 50,000 votes. It was one of the most um, high, highest turnouts. And I, I became one of the most popular legislator in, in the chamber, even though um, the career didn't last long because of Beijing's uh, political persecution. Um, but I never felt like I, I'm a politician, even though people automatically categorize you as a politician when you step into electoral politics. But I didn't really feel in that way because a lot of people see politicians as someone who lies to the people who represent big interests, who, who don't really actually think of the interests of the people. They think politics is dark, it's just about um, exchange of like big companies and, and, and a lot of power network, etc. Um, I didn't feel that in, 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 the, in the way that I portrayed myself and that I engaged in politics. Um, the reason why I participated in electoral politics, I, I actually found a political party with uh, my best friend, Joshua Wong, who is um, the most popular and prominent Hong Kong activist um, in Hong Kong, that uh, we, we believe that we need more platform. We, we need more opportunity to speak up and engaging in this ordinary setting of politics is just a means for us to continue our activism. I've always described myself as an activist. This is my very first identity. And um, being in legislature um, can sometimes facilitate that rather than stopping it. For example, I table a lot of motions about talking about Hong Kong's future, talking about Hong Kong's political reform, um, I donate a large part of my salary to civil society to help organizations to keep ongoing and try to make a change. And I continue to participate in protest. I was arrested for a few times when I was a legislator because I believe that um, the real changes has always been outside of um, the chamber. I was just trying to facilitate and amplify the voice that I had 
But I always genuinely believe that in that undemocratic system, the only way through is by the power of people. And for me, sitting in the chamber is just an, a way that I can be more influential and I can amass more people to achieve that goal. So I never felt like um, I'm um, traditionally speaking a politician or to be defined in a narrow sense that I, I'm only a parliamentarian or a legislator or a congressman. I see it a platform of my activism. And I think that's actually what we should approach to politics um, because like a lot of people feel like politics is just something that we, we, we cannot reach. It, it, it's actually not. We all have the capacity to try to be involved and try to change it. Even though you're not a politician, uh, you became an engineer, doctor, lawyer in the future, you can still be involved in that process, in the democratic process, in the process of activism. And for, for people who wanted to be involved in that settings, to step into political career, politics can be different. And you have the capacity to change it. If you are really keen on your belief and if you're really understanding what you want and how you want to reshape the political landscape. I think that was the lesson that I learned and the things that I did. Um, and I, 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 I am sure that the period of me staying in the Legislative Council, um, it was one of the most, um, I think, um, extraordinary experience I had. And I had, had never regretted that I was part of it. Thank you. Well, and that I think is so important is to know that you have no regrets and that the work that you have been doing is work that you still believe in, even after all, as I said before, that you've had to give up for that, for that cause. You know, one of the reflections I had as I was thinking about our conversation today is an often repeated quote from Father Shamanad, which says, new times call for new methods. And I'm curious in thinking about, you know, how you've been operating, you know, what do you think are the new ways in which activists can come together? And here with the Human Rights Center, we've been talking a lot the last day and even the last years really about what role can the Human Rights Center and international advocacy play for struggles uh, for democracy in other countries. And particularly now when inside the United States, we see the reports and the data that shows there's an erosion of democracy. And so the credibility that we have, um, that we used to enjoy on the international stage as not a perfect democracy by any means, but certainly one model um, that could be followed. And with that, I think erosion comes a lot of questioning. Um, at the same time, you know, for a lot of students who are here today, as they're coming to think about what role could they play, I'm sure they must look to you as such an inspiration, as someone who has achieved so much in such a relatively short period of time in your life. And sitting right beside that is a movement in the international development and human rights circles to decolonize development, to make sure that you know, the right people are having the right actions and that outsiders are not taking on roles that um, should not be you know, given to them or have been historically patterned in such a way that um, it's very fraught. And so I wonder you know, what in your eyes you know, do you see as the role for international advocacy and for international involvement to help support the struggles that you've been fighting so, so hard for? I think it's just difficult to find um, an equation that applies um, to every situation. We all have our own restraints and, and the issues that we wanted to resolve. But um, in, my, in my life journey, I, I, I felt it's really important to keep a flexible mind. Um, on the, on the one hand, you, you make sure your end goals are clear, but in the process, you should accommodate to different position and try to be flexible in order to find um, a, a way that, that is maximizing your impact and makes your advocacy more effective. There, 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 there is a, a very famous um, saying in, and it, it was actually the motto of 2019 Hong Kong protest, uh, be water. Uh, what does it mean to be water? It means that you adopt to, di to different situation in different forms in order to best perform yourself and to fit into um, the context and to, to maximize your impact. Um, for me, I was a protest leader in 2014 and I became the youngest legislator and I was unseated 
and I became an inmate. I served jail time, and and then I I I had to live in a life of exile. I'm now a wanted person in Hong Kong. So just try to imagine like from a student leader to a disqualified, to a legislator, and then to an inmate, and then to a wanted person. Um, is that, that, that has been through a lot for me in the past few years. And I must try to accommodate myself into new situation because the political landscape in Hong Kong changes. And what I encounter is actually rhythm, rhythming the erosion of freedom in Hong Kong. And if I was so stubborn, I didn't want to change. I just wanted to be a protester. I just wanted to stay in Hong Kong, etc. Then it is difficult for me to open up new possibility and new opportunity to continue my my campaign to continue to continue my voice. Um, the way that I'm doing international advocacy work for me is crucial. It's important that we still have a voice on the international level that can speak Hong Kong story and that reminds everyone that that is, there are still struggles in Hong Kong. And for people who care about democracy and who care about freedom, we should definitely pay attention to it. And that is how I come accommodate a new situation that in Hong Kong, basically we can't speak these things anymore. Um, the new national security law implemented last June basically criminalized free speech. We just had literally an individual who was sentenced to five years and nine months just because he chanted a certain slogan in certain protests without agitating violence or commit, committing violent acts. A person was sentenced to five years and nine months just because of political speech, just because of a slogan. You can see how, how traumatized and, and, and how draconian the law is and how traumatized the situation in Hong Kong. So for me, it's important that we have a clear analysis of the situation and try to fit ourselves into it, find new position when situation changes and to best utilize your voice. Um, I think this is, for me leaving Hong Kong, it's definitely a painful decision. I had to issue a public statement saying that I had to cut ties with my families because in China's context, if you are families of a human rights defenders, you could also be submitted to surveillance, to harassment, or even imprisonment just because of you are relative of someone. And I really didn't want it to happen for my family. But I also understand that by, by living abroad, I can have a voice, I can have a role to play. So I must choose between these things in my life. And um, for, for anyone, if we dare not to sacrifice part of it, we can never achieve anything. So I think that that's the constant struggle, constant dilemma, but we just have to be sure that um, we can adopt a different situation so that we can have our, have our voice heard. Thank you for that. What an incredible set of circumstances you've had to adapt to. And as I said before, I think it's so inspiring for those of us to see what you were willing to do for the cause. And that doesn't just benefit Hong Kong, it certainly benefits the globe when people see that there are people willing to give up everything, quite literally everything, in order to protect and preserve democracy. I think as everyone here knows that there is a democracy summit happening in Washington um, just not long from now, later this month. And you know that summit is the first of what will be ongoing dialogues and there will be, um, for many of us, we're pushing for what comes after the summit and what kind of actions, what kind of investments, what kind of US foreign assistance will be directed to the follow-up to that conversation. But I, you know, I'm thinking about that and I'm wondering, you know, you in 2020, along with so many other activists, have left Hong Kong, as you said, to live in exile and continue that struggle from abroad. So, you know, what do you think? Um, as we look at this, you know, what lessons does the struggle in Hong Kong have for other rights-based struggles? What kinds of things should we be talking about at a democracy summit? And we're gonna hear later from activists from India, Belarus, Sudan, the US and Chile. You know, what, what do you see in common with, with those other activists and what kinds of messages and approaches should we be taking into a global democracy summit? 
Um, I, I don't think it is announced um, publicly, but I'm officially invited by the government to give a remark um, in the sum of democracy to remind everyone how fragile freedoms are and why we should fight for democracy. I think this is a important initiative and important um, um, venue that we have to remind everyone, stop being complacent, stop taking our democracy and freedom for granted. Um, in the VDEM report last year, it says that the, since um, it, it was the first year in 2020 that there are more autocratic regimes than democratic ones since 2001. The democratic decline for two decades has been real. And I think part of the reason is we are just too complacent to the rise of authoritarianism, like the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, we have engaged them so that they can be included and they can thrive in the essential order. But we never developed mechanism to try to hold these regimes accountable when we find out that their human rights violations are so appalling, they're literally locking millions of Uyghurs in concentration camp, more than they in concentration camp. What they've done in Hong Kong and their military intimidation to Taiwan and also the treatment to Tibetan culture and, and, and Tibetan people, these are just one of the most appalling human rights violations that we are having now um, under such a powerful government, but we, we seemingly have not developed the awareness, the perception, the readiness, and also the mechanism to address them. I think that is what we have to come up with for in, in, in initiative like some of democracy or in the future, the democratic countries can get together to think about how we can curtail the uh, authoritarian expansion and the rise of it under the face of democratic decline. Um, for me, the, 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 the lessons learned from Hong Kong is very straightforward. Is if we have an unchecked government, freedoms can be lost in such an incredible speed. We're talking about after the implementation of the national security law, which criminalized our, our free speech and curtailing all sorts of political actions. And, 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 and basically they can lock the political campaigners in jail as if they want. Just in one year after the law was implemented in Hong Kong, our whole civil society with decades of foundation was crashed. Our largest independent media was disbanded. Our largest independent workers union was disbanded. Numerous, more than 50 political organizations were disbanded due to the fear of being um, persecuted. And we've got um, investigative journalists being prosecuted. We've got um, social workers, teachers, um, nurses, their unions are disbanded. We've just got so many things happened in just one year with an utterly unchecked government. And I think this is definitely a great example of why we should stand up for our freedom, why we should be vigilant about it. Because if we don't see ourselves not only as recipients of freedom, but also as guardians of it, then it will just lose to the ground, lose ground and it will just fade away so quickly. So I think this is an important essence that we should all learn. And that's the reason why I wrote the book, Freedom. It is about myself, it's about my journey from a, a, a person born in mainland China and I moved to Hong Kong and I growing up in Hong Kong to become a, a, a protest leader, legislator, an inmate and exile in London. So it's about my story, but also rhythming the erosion of freedoms in Hong Kong and also bring it to a global implication that um, it's so quick, all these two boxes um, used by the authoritarian regime and all these threats are so visible, are so salient and so dangerous. And it's not only limited in authoritarian countries, but we can definitely see in democratic countries and how we can discern them early and how we can try to do something to stop that trend. Um, I think this is a good reading. If you are interested in it, if you, are, if you want to be involved in that process of social changes, when you think ahead to say two or three or even five years from now and thinking about Hong Kong, you know, what, what changes do you think are realistic and what, what are the more ambitious changes that you would hope to see? You know, is there a pathway forward there for democracy? Are there things that you see from exile that give you hope? 
Well, I think in short term future, um, the political situation in Hong Kong is definitely green. So now we, we, we just can't see there's any incentive um, that the Chinese government would overturn its extremely heavy handed um, approach to Hong Kong because the, the world is just not reacting enough. And the reason why China can do it is because they're too confident in their totalitarian model. They're now literally more sophisticated and technologically advanced than the Orwellian states that we can read in the book of 1984. They're just too confident and the world is unable to hold them accountable. So I think unless we develop a certain mechanism that we can make them to understand that, um, well, a liberal society, freedoms, and possibly an accountable government and democracy are crucial for Hong Kong and are crucial to the global order. And they should shift their direction to that, um, to, to, to the path. Um, otherwise, we may not be able to see Hong Kong a big en enhancement in its human rights in short-term future. But I still do have hope. Um, I think on the one hand, as an activist, I'm not entitled to lose hope. Our duty and our responsibility is to encourage people, is to empower them, enlighten them to a certain extent that they can be involved in the process of precipitating social changes, to have an ambition, to have incentive to do something to, in, in, in the hope of making our society better by collective action in public sphere. And also we can see a lot of Hong Kong people that they still operate in such a tiny, tiny political scape a political scape um, that they may do small things like going to visit political prisoners, attending their court hearing, helping out their, um, their families, um, saying things um, in the public discussion that challenge the government, but not to the extent that they will be jailed, etc. cetera. There are still good people in Hong Kong that try to do something in this political situation, and it gives me hope. So I think in long term, I'll definitely be stepping foot again in Hong Kong. Maybe it will be a decade's time. Maybe it will be longer, but I'll definitely go back to the city I love. Well, that is certainly all of our hope, I'm sure, for you and that you'll be able to return home and to find not a grim picture as you described, but the one that hope has built, you know, with all the collective action and the, the sacrifices that have been made. I'm wondering too, as you think about, you know, we have so many students gathered here, not just as part of this conference, but on this campus and certainly beyond um, in lots of universities throughout the US who, who are deeply concerned about what they see in the world around them, including in Hong Kong. And are there actions that you could advise them to take that would be appropriate, that would be supportive to the cause, that would be um, energizing to you and to the others who are either living in exile or working inside of Hong Kong. And again, I think about the summit of democracies and uh, you know any kind of advocacy agenda that should be brought forward there. Well, one of the most important thing that I, I think we, we should have um, a, an understanding to is um, you can still live your life while participating in activism. You, you don't have to be a legislator you don't have to be living in a life of exile or becoming the most prominent dissident to really help the cause. If you have your profession, if you have something you're passionate about, go pursue it, go to make it as better than anyone else and devote your professionalism into the work of fighting for democracy. For example, there are a lot of initiatives that I know they need talents like design, like promotion, um, and, and maybe um, IT work to write an app, write a website to engage people. These are just as important as political activists who are just standing, um, um, standing out and to be the face of it. So I think just try to like pursue your profession and try to do something with it. I think this is important. You, we should not dissect. Um, we should not separate effort, activism from our life. And it will be better if you can blend it into your profession and to help the people who, who need these skills uh, while they may not have the resources to do it. 
Um, on the other hand, I think it is really important for us to understanding more what is happening in the world. Try to look into the lens of people's struggles and to reflect to your own and to, to have some kind of like um, action guideline for yourself in order to try to be vocal and try to be part of the community. I think in, 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 in the post COVID or no, not post COVID, post lockdown, but we're still living in a pandemic. Um, we, we just have to rebuild our community, um, maybe in a new way, in a more technologically advanced way, but we just have to build our community that we have to brainstorm, we have to talk to each other, we have to bring out issues that are important, that are important, and we must think of ways that we can be visible. I think um, sometimes we may oversee or we may neglect the importance of having like-minded people gathering together and trying to form a small community and to talk, to deliberate um, frequently. I think a lot of great ideas, a lot of brave decisions are made in this process. And I think that is crucial, especially we are all under in a world of insecurity, of uncertainty. We stop believing that our tomorrow would automatically be better. We have a lot of crises that we just have to handle it, but it's very difficult to, to, to resolve them like climate change, like pandemic, like arms proliferation, like racism, that these, these problems, we just have to address that, but it's so difficult. Um, a lot of anxiety and insecurity in our own generation. But that is the reason why we just have to be more dedicated than anyone else in anyone, any previous generations, because we finally realize that our world is not going to be better just by themselves and our system our democracy, there are a lot of flaws, a lot of problems, that we are the people who can fix them. So I think this is some mental preparation. This is some sign notes that you can take and you can rethink about how you position it and you just have to be a bit more active and find your allies and try to do something. You know, I'm so glad to hear you talk about the importance of community. That's something that's very core to the Marianists. It's very core to the University of Dayton and to the Human Rights Center. And I hope that you will feel the support of this community as you continue your journey of activism and your struggle for democracy. I think you've also called out the importance of conversations. And I was with some people on campus the other night bemoaning the lack of civil discourse and the fact that you know, at least here in the US, you find such divides and such stark disagreements that people are polarized and not sitting, as you said, together, coming up with ideas or sharing a conversation. And I think that it can lead to a hopelessness. And it has certainly led in some cases to the cancel culture where someone says something that's perceived wrongly or is um, something that shouldn't have been said perhaps, and, and that person is canceled. And I think that's a, another form of exile in a way from public debate and dialogue and uh, the inability to really sit together across differences and find what links us and find, as I said in the beginning, that common humanity. And so I, I hope that you know, your message will really resonate with people and I'm delighted to hear, we'll keep the news quiet until it's announced publicly, but um, that you will be at the, the Summit for Democracy. I think your voice is such an essential one. And, you know, it's been a great honor to have you here for this conversation today. I think you've really helped to set the tone for this, um, this conference and focusing on social and nonviolent civil resistance that really does galvanize youth to advocate for democracy and racial and other forms of justice and human rights. And this keynote conversation really sets the tone uh, for the following plenaries on social movements and civil resistance and on anti-rights and democratic regression, as well as those on racial justice movements at the UN. And this will link together with the keynote that's happening tonight with Dr. Erica Chenoweth, who will be talking from her new book about civil resistance, what everyone needs to know. So it's been a wonderful opportunity to frame some of these big important issues. And I know that we have people, I know you can't see us, but there are microphones set up so that people here in the audience and I presume online as well, will be able to ask questions of you if that's okay. And 
I will invite people to the microphone to be able to um, put your questions forward, or if they're online, hopefully someone will read them for us. So <clears throat> good morning, uh, good afternoon, I guess where you are. My name is Rob Robinson. I'm based in New York City. Mine are not necessarily questions, um, more comments about uh, some of the thoughts that you presented us with. And I, I just really appreciate the context that you shared with us. As an organizer and an activist based in New York, the word sacrifice struck me as you were talking about it. I think we miss in this country the fact that we do civil disobedience and direct action as a sacrifice to make true social change. So I appreciated the context with which you presented that in. Last night while we were sitting at dinner, I talked a lot about my admiration for working with students. And I think the mindset has changed in the US about young folks wanting to make true social change. And it was interesting to hear you say that students have design skills, IT skills, and this is what I gravitate towards in New York because I don't have that skill set. I know what is necessary to make the social change. So how do you bring people together to, to make that change? And I do think there is a, there's a current of young folks in this country that really want to make social change. They don't want to live the life that they've heard about and seen in the past. They're like yourself that wants to make change. I'm also encouraged by the fact that you encourage people to go into elected office, which I have always despised from my place in New York when people were challenging me to go into elected office, but you did something to my mindset. And I'll close by saying this. Um, you used the word human rights defenders. I'm gonna challenge you to think about this in the future. Human rights enforcer, human rights exist. We're just enforcing those rights. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Great comments, thank you very much. I really like that. What a mind shift that is if we think about defenders. That's a really good way to conceptualize it. Hello, hi, Nathan. My name is Natalie Hudson and I am a professor here at the University of Dayton. And I have the distinct pleasure of directing our undergraduate degree program in human rights studies. So we're one of the few universities in the country that offers bachelor's degrees in human rights. And many of the students in that program, majors and minors are here today to hear you. So we're really grateful uh, for your time today. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about how notions of human rights uh, in, informed your work and your thinking and, and your maybe survival tactics in the various stages of your journey thus far in terms of being a student protester, a legislator, an inmate, and now a person in exile. How have your, how has I, ideas of human rights informed uh, and supported and maybe challenged in, in those times? And maybe how have your ideas about human rights evolved in those, um, over the course of those various uh, spaces in which you occupied in, in very short order. Thank you very much. Um, well, th thank you so much for um question. I, I think human rights indeed plays an important role in how we narrate our own story. It's a common language that a, a lot of us would understand. It gives um, a lot of our arguments and um, naturally, um, well, compelling and convincing element by laying out um, what, what these human rights are and should be and what these human rights should protect us um, from the intervention and suppression from the government. So I think this is uh, definitely one of the narration that connects all of us is not only people in Hong Kong, but the people around the world while we are facing so many different problems, challenges, and maybe suppression but we always can find a common language. And by finding common language, we can um, be united. We can, um, well, definitely create some impacts together 
So I think that impact is really important. And for me, I, I think um, it's difficult to kind of like narrate how, how I conceptualize human rights throughout my, my, my path because my angle is just so clear. It's democratic rights of Hong Kong people. We should be able to elect our own leaders and the leaders should be held accountable by the people. Um, so I, I think it is very straightforward and everyone can understand that. Um, I don't have to explain um, in, 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 in most of the occasions that why democratic rights are important to people, why it, it is our innate right, right? It is natural for us to do so. So I think um, this is a definite framework that we can utilize. And I think if we are talking about um, the politics today, we're talking about what we're lacking, I think it is really important for us to put our emphasis on empathy, to put our emphasis on how we understand differences, how we have the capacity to try to understand um, the pathway of people deriving, arriving into their faith, into their belief, even though you don't agree with them. Um, it is in a very important practice for me, important belief for me that only politics with empathy and only politicians with that capacity of understanding differences can we mend the rift and can we try to do something and can we form coalition to precipitate social change. Otherwise, in, in today's politics, it's just way too fragmented, way too tribalized and seemingly for click bites, for, I don't know, for consolidating a, a very extreme view, we just seemingly intentionally becoming people who lack empathy. And I just don't think this is the way our politics should move forward. Thank you, Nathan. I think empathy is one of the most important characteristics that a leader can have. And I think the way that you describe how that can help people find that common cause, even when they don't agree with each other is in my mind, one of the absolutely most overlooked um, parts of, of organizing and resistance. Good afternoon, Nathan. Thank you so much for joining us here. My name is Jackie Smith and I'm from Pittsburgh. I teach sociology and I organize with our Human Rights City Alliance. And um, just reflecting on some of the conversation we've been having this morning and thinking about how it relates to our conversations about human rights, I think a lot of our work is about changing cultures and, and changing attitudes and you've reflected on that. And one of the attitudes that I'm seeing in, in my work and I think is reflected in your challenge in your book, you know, what are we willing to give up for our freedom? I think our democratic institutions or so-called democratic institutions have created passive citizens and, and people who aren't willing to do very much at all for um, to defend um, ideas of democracy and freedom and even think about the complexities of some of the, the issues that are on our political debate. So um, thinking about the relationship between um, movements and government, how, uh, how can we um, use our movements to really rebuild the institutions that are in our places. And we're finding this in trying to develop human rights cities and, and organize around that framework that the institutions that we have were not built for human rights. They weren't built to help protect and deliver human rights. And um, as Rob was saying, we have to be human rights defenders. And, and we also have to be institution builders. <laughs> and then figure out how do we redesign the institutions. Um, but really we're making a plane as we're flying it. Um, we have these institutions and we have to figure out how to move from where we are to where we're going. And your experience, I think, brings some insights into, you know, how can we work with movements and with government? Um, because often we think of movements against government and, and a lot of people, in movements don't trust you if you work with government. But I'm finding in human rights city work, we have to work with elements of, of our local government and even think beyond local to get what we need in our communities. So 
maybe you can reflect some on the relationships of movements and government and the role that we have as human rights organizers to help people take ownership of our government. And in a democracy, we are government, but we've been told by the ideology of capitalism and neoliberalism that government is bad and the private sector is good and businesses should be given freedom and citizens should just um, be consumers. <laughs> so how do we, um, or what insights can you bring to these struggles? Thank you. Well, um, thank you for your question. Um, I, I think it's really difficult for me to conceptualize uh, how we can interact with the government because in Hong Kong, the government is just so suppressive and they don't really interact with us. Um, but I think I, 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 I can always find a lot of like human rights organizers um, are struggling in how to build movement, build coalition. And um, I have some insights or experience to share. And it's about, it, it's not necessarily how we can build a perfect narrative. It's about how we can conduct effective communication and how we can make people from different camps or different ideas and backgrounds come together. And I think it, it, it is not something that we can naturally gain or um, as long as we have a perfect theory so that we can mobilize people to change. Um, in my conceptualization of effective communication, you must know who you're talking to. You must know your audience and you must talk in a way that to intrigue their interest, that they feel like they are on the same page with you, even though you have a lot of differences so that they would love to work with you and to, to proceed. Um, so I think understanding what the people you're talking to need and trying to navigate a way that you can overlap something in, in any ways. Um, it helps to promulgate the conversation. Um, it helps to pull, pull everyone together. Um, we have an innate nature that people like to label, people like to categorize, and it is our nature for us to make our life easier. And to become a, co a community organizer or movement builder, you must actively counter this instinct and to try to convince everyone that to loosen their labels and loosen their guards and try to come up with something that we can build on common ground and continue our discussion. Um, so I think understanding that thinking things that are in common and, and talk on top of it, building up trust. Um, but also um, for me, I, I have a very, I have a habit and I s rarely use jargon. I rarely use languages that could build knowledge barrier to ordinary people, to people who just don't have the time to digest all these complex concepts um, in order to invite them to join us. Um, well, social movement is about people. The big companies have money, government has political power, but for civil society and, 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 and civil sector, we only have the people um, and finding a way that can lessen um, the barrier and threshold for people to get involved is also our duty and finding a way that can explain to them without much difficulties is also our duty. So I, I think all these things, um, it helps me to better understand who am I, to better, to, to become more humble, to, to, to try to talk to people from different camps, to try to find common grounds and try to counter our instinct and to, to, to build coalition. I think it's just as important as we find the right course, the right ends to pursue. Having these equipment and, and understanding is also crucial. Good morning, Nathan. My name is Angie. It's a great honor to hear you speak. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I was born in the US to um, parents who are Taiwanese immigrants and grandparents who are uh, refugees to Taiwan from China. Um, and social justice and um, human rights work has always been important to me. Um, I think this year has been a huge year for the AAPI, the Asian American Pacific Islander community um, in the US to reflect on activism and our political identity um, for various reasons. Um, and for me as well, personally this year to think about what, about my identity and my social, social justice political work. So I'm, I'm asking you two questions, especially now that you are based in London. The first question would be, 
for members of the Chinese diaspora, um, what are ways in which we can better engage and learn about what is happening in Hong Kong and China? Um, how, do, how do we develop our identities even though we are not there? We are in a different place, but it is part of, part of who we are, our family, our histories. And, and the, the second question is, what do you think um, we can do to contribute to the movement, to, to your work, um, to the work for democracy in that part of the world, um, given, given our identities, but our placement here and um, outside, of, outside of Asia? Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you so much for your question. Um, I think, first of all, for accessing information about Hong Kong, um, this may sound lame, but I think it is actually useful to, to follow journalists who cover Hong Kong on Twitter. Twitter is quite different from the other social media. It is designed for circulation of information. Um, and it is designed for you to have access to knowledge rather than some like small stuff, gossip, be life of the others. Um, so I, 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 I don't receive any advertisement fee from Twitter, but I think it is um, for me a, a, a good way to, to, to have direct information from journalists who cover on the ground firsthand and to have access to information that you may not have them on international media just because they may not be tempting for them to write a coverage. So I think that is exactly what we have to do when we're in an age of um, a lot of things are <laughs> have to be done by ourselves. Um, we're, we're not sitting here to be fed with information. We have to actively seat those things and, and those channels. Um, secondly, I think um, find what you're passionate about. Um, you may not be passionate about Hong Kong, but you must be passionate about Taiwan. And in some essence, supporting Taiwan's status in the international community, urging China to stop military intimidation to Taiwan and making sure that Taiwan is being listened to and being included in international um, community is also a very good way to counter China's um, authoritarian expansion and, and, and their very diligent attitude towards democracies like, China, like, like Taiwan. And it, on some certain extent, also helps to craft a better environment for Hong Kong people to against um, go against this uh, authoritarian coercion. So I think um, this is something that we can do. There are lots of organizations campaign um, in, in, in the US. You, it may not be nearby your hometown, but you can always do digital things. You can always tweet and you can talk to them, share your story, share to your friends. Um, I think in, 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 in these times, um, there are actually a lot of things that it may sound like not very effective, but by sharing your stories, by creating social media posts, that may really help people to in increase their understanding towards the cause. And it may, like small things like this accumulate. So I think that's what we can do by sharing our stories, by following what we're passionate about and try to find ways that we can engage with them. Thank you very much. Great questions and great answer. I think this will have to be our last question. I know we're, I'm running up against the end of our session together. So we'll give you the last question. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Nathan, for your testimony and all this uh, brave history and all of your work. So I'm Rafael. I'm uh, working in Lima, Peru. Um, and I'm working particularly on the issue of mining uh, in different parts of the country. And my questions are a little bit related to two things that stood out of your of your testimony and analysis and that can be relevant for us uh, in Peru. I think our fights, of course, are also with uh, the Chinese government in a way as, uh, as China is the main commercial partner of Peru. Uh, two of the areas where I work most is Chinese mining companies. So one of the hypotheses that we have, China kind of displaced the United States as being the main commercial partner of the country, and it also seems to have displaced the United States as kind of the teacher of repressive methods and of what are the ways to criminalize uh, local communities and organizers. So something that I thought when listening to you, when you said that the ways in which repression is taking place is going beyond what was in 1984, the novel. So there seems to be a lot to learn also of how to resist these new methods, far more subtle of criminalization of repression, and, and probably you have there 
uh, confronted the, the most elaborated forms of this. So I was thinking, how can we learn of what are the new ways in which this is taking place, right? And I'm thinking of, for us in Peru, knowing the methods that you have been using to kind of resist this level of repression would be, would be really relevant. So what are the lessons there and, and, and how could that be shared? Second question, really quickly. The other thing that I really liked about what you said was this kind of combination of short term and long term, right? You said the long term goals, that's what needs to drive us. And then we need to be water to adapt in the short term to the kind of changing conditions. So it seems that we're living in a world in which we need really radical kind of change, but the conditions are not allowing this. So how can we work in the short term, as you said, uh, in planting seeds that then can build on towards the long term, deeper change? So I, I think you already referred to this, but if you have some more thoughts on this, that would be really helpful. And thanks so much again. Yeah, thank you so much for your questions. Um, uh, uh, well, in my new book, Freedom, I, I've laid out the, the, the authoritarian toolboxes that um, the government could do to hero our freedom. For example, um, they would do a lot of things in our press freedom. They Bought, buy out all our media company and slowly swap pro Beijing people to the leadership role in order to control the direction of reporting. They criminalize um, uh, 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 investigative journalism so that people can no longer have the tools to assess to truth that could really tear off um, the disguise of the government. And they also, of course, dispense our media company. They, they treat uh, reporters much more brutally in protests um, et cetera. Um, so I think there are lots of things that we can learn from Hong Kong's um, uh, uh, situation in which uh, we are facing the most powerful authoritarian country or even totalitarian country in the world, but we still have certain kind of info, uh, freedom of information flow that we can learn more from its operation. Um, and on the second question, I think one of the most important thing is um, uh, we just have to focus on small steps, small progress. Sometimes, like for example, fighting for democracy for Hong Kong is just definitely a long journey. It's much more difficult. But um, if we keep thinking that it is impossible to achieve, then you just step yourself into a mud of depressed. But if we try to focus on small steps, small help to the people, um, I feel more political prisoners feeling supported. I feel more um, international media coverage ongoing. Then I think you can at least create certain momentum and, and, and a feeling of a little bit of success that keeps you moving. So I think having that understanding is, is important. And we, we, we just don't have to make ourselves as a saint or as someone who was so um, perfect, uh, who does not feel disappointed, distressed, who can take active them. All these sentiments are there and we just have to find a ways to cope with them. Nathan, you've given us all so much to think about today and so much to be inspired by. And I was reflecting more than 20 years ago when I worked for the Undersecretary of Global Affairs in the State Department. There were a lot of high level meetings with the White House and USAID and others talking about even then the rise of authoritarianism. And one of the things that people bemoaned was the fact that authoritarianism, authoritarians were taking pages from each other's playbooks and they were being very coordinated in their actions and very deliberate and they were learning a lot from one another. And I think today you have given us so much hope. Um, you've, you've encouraged us to share that information to counter those authoritarians, to take the page of coordination and deliberate action, you know, and us as democracy defenders and as enforcers, I really like that, you know, really thinking about the ways in which we can be coordinated. And so I hope that you will take away from this conversation just a groundswell of support for the work that you're doing, for um, the efforts that you're making. And I am certainly going to reflect on small steps. That is something I am not good at at all. I'm always looking for the big leaps and the, um, the big <laughs> delivery of something that has huge impact. And so it, I take that one very personally as a good reminder of just the power of those small steps. And sometimes it's just keeping a light on for democracy or keeping a light on for human rights um, you know, person who has, has lost so much and given up so much and continuing to defend them. So I, I want to thank you for the inspiration. I want to thank you for sharing your time and insights with this conference. You've certainly set us off in very good directions. And we will not only read your book, but we will be continuing to watch 
um, the things you do and you can count on support from this community. Thank you so much, Anne. So thanks so much, Anne. Um, before I tell you we have a 15 minute break for coffee and um, chilling out, I do want to encourage you to use the QR code that you have on your table. Everybody take a moment, including students, please, to use the QR code and use your phones or, or your computer if you want to use the bit.ly to start feeding your reflections in to and your thoughts into our learning through SPHR. Whatever came to you, whatever insights, whatever spoke to you or resonated with you from Anne's comments, Nathan's comments, share that with us. It's really very important that we learn what you are learning and that we gather that together um, and, and take the insights from this uh, conference forward. Other than that, please join us for conversation, coffee and food. It's 15 minutes and then we will reconvene here for our first plenary. Thanks again for coming. <laughs>